people that are participating in the um, dramatic reading. Actually, I don't know how many of us there are. <laughs> this is it. All right. Our scripture reading this morning is Luke 22, verse 7 through 38. This is from the New Revised Standard Version. Then came the day of unleavening bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us, that we may eat it. They asked him, Where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks you, Where is the guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as it had been told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table, and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, the, king of the, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? He is not the one at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer to you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, as you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribal, tribes of Israel. Before you go, I had too many pages. We skipped one. Start at 31. 31. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all you like wheat. Uh, but I have prepared for you that your own faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. He said to them, when I sent you out with a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, No, not a thing. He said to them, But now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag. And the one who has not no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless, and indeed that was written about me, is being fulfilled. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He replied, It is enough. <laughs> May the Lord have <coughs> his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. This sermon was prepared for this morning by Susan, um, so forgive me if I... She's titled this, His Last Supper. The last week of the life of our Lord, the time that we refer to as Holy Week, 
is the most significant of his life. For the past three Sundays, we have been examining in some detail the events that occurred during that period. We've looked at Sunday, the day of celebration, Monday, the day of emotion, and Tuesday, the day of questions. Continuing this morning, I would like to examine Wednesday, the day of transition, and Thursday, the day of fellowship. Jesus' final week can be divided into three phases. The first two days of the week find the masses in a mood of acceptance and praise. The middle of the week, they began to question and challenge. By the end of the week, their attitude had completely changed to rejection and crucifixion. Wednesday is the day in between. It is the day I like to refer to as the day of transition and preparation. Jesus knew this change was coming. So on Wednesday, he went apart from the crowd to be in meditation and communion with God. He needed to lay hold of the power of God that would enable him to turn defeat into victory. This scene reminds us that we occasionally need to be free of the things and circumstances that clutter our lives. We need time to clear our heads and be in fellowship with the divine. David Stanley, New York Times reporter who went to Africa in search of Dr. Livingston, wrote a fascinating biography. He noted that for several days, his safari made excellent time. But then one morning, the porters refused to move at all. He asked the guide, what's, what's the problem? It's a native superstition, he replied. They feel that they must stop the day to give their souls a chance to catch up. Wednesday of Holy Week says to us that we must occasionally take time out of our schedules and have time for introspection. That's harder for some than others. <coughs> Type A personalities, it can be extremely difficult. Many of you are familiar with the story of Elijah the prophet. He was the one who took on the 450 prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel. He was totally successful in conquering the godless enemy, but he was stunned to discover that even though he had won the battle, the wicked Queen Jezebel was still on the throne. Not only that, she had put a contract out on Elijah. So he ran. And he ran and he ran until he was totally exhausted and could run no more. Prayed to God, take my life. You see, when we are exhausted, we are not ourselves. We do things and say things that are not like us. It is at that point that God comes to Elijah and asks, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now you see, that is what is known as a rhetorical question. God knows the answer. He wants Elijah to say it so that he will have to hear himself, so that he will have a time of transition from running to turning back and standing firm. When we run from our responsibilities, God asks us, what are you doing here? We all need that time of transition and preparation. We can't step into mission and ministry until we've prepared for that transition. And preparation comes through prayer and meditation. In the most important week of his life, Holy Week, Jesus took time to be a part on that Wednesday, to be alone. We will never realize that we are deaf until we <coughs> are silent. Our failure to take time apart and be reflected will inevitably result in a spiritual break with our Creator. Reverend Charles Stewart is a retired Methodist minister and tells us some of the most marvelous stories. It seems that when he was growing up in rural Mississippi, during his childhood, they drew the, the family drew their water from an old well in the backyard. It had always been there as long as anyone could remember. The supply of water was in, inexhaustible. The water was always clear and cool, even during the years of drought in, surrounding, in the surrounding countryside. The steward's old well 
never failed to produce. One day, however, his father had modern plumbing put in. To do that, a new artesian well had to be dug several hundred yards away, and the old faithful family well was ordered out. Four or five years later, half out of curiosity and half out of loyalty for that old well, the father uncovered the old well so he could taste that cool, clear water once again. Much to his surprise, it was dry. He called in an expert to figure out what happened. It seems that the well was fed by hundreds of little streams or rivulets that would dry up if not constantly used. In the years of non-use, the clay had clogged them up. And thus there was no water, not because there was no water there, but because it was not used. Our spiritual life, if it is not exercised, will no longer be self-evident to others. Not because it is not there, rather because of the lack of use. Many of us need to have those spiritual channels cleansed and reopened. We've gone too long on our cleverness and ingenuity. We're like a sponge that has been squeezed and squeezed until you can get nothing more out of it. It's time to reconnect with the source. It is so easy to be religious yet still miss the kingdom. So easy to be centered in ourselves that we cease growing. If we are not open to the indwelling, of the Holy Spirit, we can miss it all. On Wednesday, that Wednesday, Jesus took time to be in communion with God. If Wednesday was the day of transition and preparation, then Thursday was the day of fellowship. In the evening of that day, an admirer of Jesus, we do not know who, loaned the upper floor of his house to the disciples and Jesus to come together to partake of the Passover. In this ancient meal, Jews eat certain symbolic foods to remind them of their former bondage in Egypt. Their herb is eaten to remind them of the bitterness of the experience. Applesauce is eaten to remind them that they were required to make bricks without straw. It was at this point that Jesus took the unleavened bread and broke it and spoke the ancient words of the Baruch. Blessed art thou, O God, Lord of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the earth. Suddenly Jesus broke with tradition and began to speak in his native Aramaic. Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Jesus then took the cup and said, Take, drink. This is my blood shed for you. Thus to an ancient symbolic meal, Jesus added the symbolism of his broken body and blood shed for us. Anna Pavlova, a Russian ballerina, was once asked what she meant with certain dance that she had just performed. And she replied, if I could tell you, I wouldn't have to do the dance. On Thursday of Holy Week, Jesus dramatized the mystery of faith. What God could not convey in words alone, he expressed in human flesh, the body and blood of his own son. Now I will admit that like most parents, there were days when I have been, would have been willing to let you have my kids. Now, this is Susan talking, but I think Debbie and I might, there might be a few. <laughs> but can you even envision in the most somber moment giving up your child as a sacrifice we can't understand the depth of God's grace unless we see it in that light. In the same way, fellowship in the church needs to be understood. We hear it and we think of a potluck meal, but true fellowship is expressed in the words of John Wesley. If your heart is like my heart, then give me your hand and we will walk together. We need to cherish our time of coming together as family, as friends, as the church. The day was not yet over for Jesus. He went up to Mount Olive and prayed and spoke to a crowd. It was here that Judas came up to him and gave him a kiss. I've often wondered why he did that. 
I mean, why didn't he just spit in his face? Why didn't he slap him? But no, he gave him a kiss. It's a sobering reminder that even in the name of love, we can sometimes still hurt. When we do not give people room enough to let them grow, we can hurt in the name of love. When we love our ideas more than we love people, we can hurt in the name of love. We all love Christ. But we have all hurt Christ at one time or another. The kiss of Judas perhaps should remind us that we can end up hurting the ones we love most. We are told that after the Lord's Supper, the disciples sang the hymn and departed, as we will in a few moments. Let it be a reminder of the importance of our fellowship. Let it connect us all to our brother Jesus, for whom on that Thursday night so long ago, the clock was now tipping. Jesus' date of destiny could now be measured in hours. Calvary awaited him. Amen.